Welcome back, everybody. We have now uh, come to the final session of the Blue Forest Week, session six. Uh, we're turning to English. This session will mainly be in English, however, with two Norwegian interventions. They will be subtitled in, uh, in English. Uh, this session is going to uh, be pretty heavy with quite a few researchers and others uh, telling us about the importance of restoration of blue forests. I brought with me a new expert in studio called Tanya Bryan. She's from GRID. Welcome to you, Tanya. Thank you so much. And also, we would want, before we start, to kind of try and wrap up uh, 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 the week a bit with uh, Hege, who was with me in studio yesterday. So Hege, what are the important takeaways from, uh, from the week, you think? Yes, yesterday uh, there were two very interesting sessions, uh, one about um, the status and the, um, the services that Blue Forest provide. And we learned that it's, it is so many services from these uh, Blue Forests and actually they are also worth a huge amount of money if we really dare to, to put some monetary value on it. Um, and then we learned that there are some beautiful, nice forests in Norway still, but there are also some challenges mm -hmm. in uh, the north due to the sea urchin grazing. And there are some challenges in the south due to this turf algae problematic and the eutrophication. Um, and finally, we had uh, the Minister of Fisheries and Ocean Policy, uh, and he was giving very uh, prom uh, some promises that the government will follow the Helhetli plan for the uh, and I think uh, probably that is a good starting point for today's discussion. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Thank you so much, uh, Hege. I'll have to ask you, Tanya. You're kind of the expert uh, here. Why is the restoration of blue forests so important? Sure. Thank you. Um, so the restoration is. These are extremely valuable ecosystems, as, as Hege has just said. They provide a really wide range of benefits, um, everything from storm protection to fisheries. Um, a number of important commercial fisheries um, really rely on these types of ecosystems, as well as, of course, the carbon storage. So the more of these ecosystems that we have that are healthy, the better it is for all of us. So can you tell us also, what is the aim of the UN uh, decade of restoration that we happen to be in right now? Sure. So the purpose of the decade really is to highlight the massive need to accelerate the global restoration of these degra uh, degraded ecosystems globally. Um, it's really a call to action to halt, to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide. Thank you very much. Um, uh, before we move uh, to our first uh, intervention, let me remind you that you can be interactive both in the Q&A function and uh, also through the chat uh, function. We would very much like you to do that. Our first expert is uh, Hans Christian Strand. He's a researcher at IMR, the Norwegian Institute of Marine Research, who has been working on blue, uh, growing blue forests in northern Norway to increase healthy coastal fish. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Hans Christian. Uh, thank you. Just a <laughs> short introduction then, uh, before this video is played. But um, we observed that uh, during this um, during this uh, grazing event in the 1970s, that also the local um, fjord uh, fish stocks, many of them collapsed, and. Uh, uh, or that, although that's just a correlation and not a direct um, cause and effect relationship, uh, we also saw that during the decades that followed that um, this fish, many of these fish stocks did not recover, even though there was a, a lowered uh, fishing pressure. And we then started to look more into this, um, that, that, that this blue forest was a part of the life, early life uh, cycle of this uh, collapsed stocks and uh, that it was important to uh, recover them as part of this um, rebuilding plan. So then we started to work with this uh, liming, uh, li do this liming work and, and we can go into the details afterwards if you like to discuss them. But um, yeah, uh, and, and we, know, we now think that this, um, this 
is kelp forest are, uh, are ex, uh, very important, particular for the early juvenile stages. But uh, also when you plan a rebuilding plan, you need to take other uh, aspects into co considerations. And I will briefly come into that in this videos, video we are about to see as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hans Christian. Uh, I would want to uh, ask you a question also for follow up. Uh, can you tell me just exactly how uh, are blue forests supporting healthy fisheries? Well, as, as I tried to mention that in, in these fjords, uh, we think that these, the stocks are oft, often very local and, and um, complete the, the life cycle in the fjords. And particularly for the juvenile stages, when they go from the pelagic to the bottom living stages, like coastal cod and psyche, they, they settle in these vegetated areas. And if there are only barrens there, they uh, probably will uh, influence the air class strength of those uh, species that are dependent on these uh, vegetated systems. So we think it's an essential part of uh, recovering the stock, so the vegetation is also recovered. Thank you very much, Hans Christian. You'll be staying with us for the discussion later on. We'll move on. Uh, in some areas, blue forests have disappeared because the rocky habitat has been destroyed. Our next Peter, uh, speaker is Peter, uh, who will talk to us about restoration, um, restoring these habitats can recover kelp forests in the Skagerrak. Please, Peter. Well, thank you. Um, Yes, so I am a scientist at Aarhus University in Denmark, where we have some experience in restoring what we call boulder reef habitats in Danish waters. And um, some of these are more successful than others. And I'll give uh, some brief introductions to the experiences we have and some recommendations. So if you look at the um, bottom in main Danish coastal waters. It's quite soft bottom, but that was brought with glaciers during recent uh, um, uh, 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 ice ages. Um, boulders material from Sweden and Norway that was left behind scattered in some places formed uh, structures that actually uh, have been removed quite um, vividly. Um, up to 55 square kilometers of reef have been removed and used for building materials in harbors and piers, et cetera. So habitats have actively been removed over a period of more than 100 years, and this has now stopped, but obviously this has affected the distribution of these uh, habitats. Now, as has been mentioned many times, there's uh, many different types of services and um, and, and, and functions associated with such types of habitats. And here you see a diver in a very dense um, kelp forest, which can also be um, in Danish coastal waters. And uh, I will not go into detail, just say that there is both in terms of biodiversity, climate and eutrophication, high importance of these um, types of habitats that has been documented um, for various types of systems. So with the loss of these, we have also lost a lot of functions um, also protecting us against the climate changes that are happening. So these boulder reefs have been, you know, they're scattered all around the inner parts of Danish waters. So Norway is north of this, but in the, um, these red dots sort of identifies where we have these boulder reefs. And then there are some star signs that identify areas where we have actively try to restore um, reefs that were previously there, but have been degraded. And also we do a lot of eelgrass restoration. So um, this area here in the Northern part of Kattegat, Lesser Trenl has been restored there. You can see there is like in, on the right hand side, uh, a 3D image of the bathymetry before. And then you can see afterwards here that we um, actively restored, um, de deploying lots of um, boulders that were brought in from Norway, actually. Um, 86,000 tons of boulders at a value of 5 million euros, um, extending over 10, 1 to 10 meters of depth. We restored what was the equivalent of uh, 5 hectares or 50,000 square meters. So in a, a Danish scale, quite a large restoration. And you can see here how it looked before 
in the photic zone, you see that there are plants in this um, material, but now adding these hard substrates, uh, providing cages and, and refuges for plants, you can see there's been a large restoring of the distribution of, of plants over time, eventually ending up in this kelp forest that hosts a lot of um, uh, uh, plant material, but also sessile and mobile organisms, important also for the uh, for the fisheries. So that has been quite successful in this area, largely due to the fact that it's quite clear water, big water exchange, and that was very clearly and very well uh, planned and organized. But we also have experiences from other places. This is an underwater photo from the um, uh, fjord called Limfjorden, which is quite eutrophic, unclear waters. And even though this is only at four meters depth, um, we can see that it is uh, very strongly influenced by the fast growing filamentous algae that uh, overtake the system. And so these large kelp species that we know exist in the system have not yet been introduced and the system is not very likely to recover into the state that we would like, mostly because of light conditions. So with this, I want to stay. My thanks, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, is the camera on? Thank you, Peter. I should have given you a better introduction. This is Peter Starr, professor at Aarhus University. Tanya, would you have a follow-up questions for Peter? Sure, thank you, Peter, for a really interesting presentation. Um, I was just wondering, how many kilometers does the project plan to restore with this um, intervention? Yeah, so, I mean, we have lost an equivalent of 55 square kilometers, right, in Danish waters over these more than 100 years. So it's not one project as such, but in a long-term perspective, we would like to restore all of this, uh, maybe with the help from Norway to bring in boulders, who knows? Uh, I think it's uh, very, very ambitious to aim for 55 square kilometers, uh, realizing that we have not yet reached more than half, maybe a square kilometer uh, at the maximum. But uh, the eventual goal could be to restore all of it. Great. Thank you so much. Good luck. Um, so now we are um, going to, to step back a little bit and have the, the presentation from Hans Christian Strand. Um, who we heard speak a little bit earlier. På slutet av 1960-talet la brukare av Farsangefjorden i Finnmark märka att tareskogen försvant och blev ersatta med naken bunn och täta förekomster av kråkebollar. I löp av 1970-talet blev mesta parten av vegetationen i fjorden nedbeta. Nedbeting av tare och annan vegetation i Porsangefjorden var del av ett större dramatiskt nationalt nedbetingsfenomen som sträckte sig från Nordtrøndelag i söder till kusten av Murmansk i norr. Vi kan inte vara säkra på orsaken till den våldsamma upplomstringen av kråkebollar, men ett dokumenterat kystnärt överfiske av kråkebollepredatorer som hyser och stenbit är i alla fall sannsynliga medverkande orsaker. Tareskogen är ett av klodens mest produktiva ökosystem och består i tillägg av komplexa tredimensionella strukturer som kan vara gunstiga leveområden för både stora och små organismer. Bestanden av kyst och fjortorsk har yngel som om hösten i sitt första leveår går över från att leva pelagisk till att slå sig ner i grunna områden med marin vegetation. Bestanden av fjortorsk kollapsade omtrent samtidigt med att tareskogen försvann. Krokebollebestanden visste sig vara svårt stabil och i stand att hålla områden nedbeta i minst 40-50 år utan själv och kollaps. Det var därför naturligt att se på om det var möjligt att genomföra tiltag som kunde föra till reducerat kråkebollebestånd och ny växt av tareskog i nedbeta områden. Kråkebollar är i utgångspunkten ett eftertraktat och värdefullt kommersiellt produkt på grund av den välsmakande rågna. Ett kommersiellt fiskeri efter kråkebollar kunde därför löst problemet, men kråkebollar i nedbeta områden innehåller dessvärre för lite rågn till att vara kommersiellt intressant. Och även om uppföringsförsök var vällyckat i labbskala var det ingen som grejde att skalera uppföring till kommersiellt nivå. Det jobbas i medeltid fortsatt med att lösa uppföringsproblematiken. Dykkare som knuser kråkebollar med hammer har också skapat igenväxt av tareskog, men metoden är dyr och arbetskrävande och svår att skalera upp till stora områden. Ett alternativ till fiskeri av kråkebollar är att ta liv av dem med bränt kalk. När man bränner vanlig kalk vid cirka 1000 grader förvandlas kemin slik att den har en kortvarig ätsen effekt i vatten för den reagerar tillbaka till vanlig kalk igen. Kråkebollar är speciellt följsam för den kortvariga ätseffekten. 
Utviklingsarbeidet har vært et samarbeid mellom Havforskningsinstituttet, den kommersielle kalkprodusenten Fransefoss og forskningsinstituttet NIVA. Når kalkbehandlingen er vellykket, kommer tareskogen nesten umiddelbart tilbake i områder som har stått nedbeitet i 40-50 år. Mange er bekymret for dødelighet på marint liv utover kråkeboller, som er målet for behandlingen. Noe slik dødelighet er uunngåelig, men kråkeboller og andre pigghuder er mer følsom enn de fleste andre marine organismer. Her ser vi et område to uker etter kalkbehandling, med mange døde kråkeboller, mens ordskjellene lever i beste velgående. Organismer som beskytter av skall, slim eller med evn til å grave seg ned, er mindre følsom for kalkbehandling enn pigghuder. Noen ganger kalker vi kråkebolledominerte områder uten suksess. Når vi kommer tilbake etter ett år finner vi omtrent like mange kråkeboller og følgelig ingen ny tareskog. Vi tror den viktigste årsaken til manglende effekt er at habitatet inneholder mange gjømmesteder for spesielt små kråkebollerekrutter, og at disse overlever behandlinger og rekrutterer til overflaten. Vi tror det er mulig å overvinne denne begrensningen, men det gjenstår enda å vise i praksis. Restaurering av økosystemer krever en helhetlig tilnærming, og det er viktig at man ikke blir alt for fokusert på enkeltfaktorer. I Porsangefjordprosjektet ser vi for eksempel at bunnlevende predatorer som ulke er tallrike i de grunne bunnslåingsområdene, og sannsynligvis den viktigste predatoren på nylig bunnslått yngel. Og det viser seg at ulka er mestre i å bruke vegetasjon under yngeljakta. Karforsøk viser at ulkene gjemmer seg i vegetasjon under jakta på fiskeyngel, og at de blir svært effektive predatorer når ungsei og ungtorsk jakter ovenfra og presser dem ned i vegetasjon. Så vi kan stille spørsmålet om det er mer ulke nå enn før, og om hva som i tilfelle er årsaken til det. I påvente av mer kunnskap om ulka og deres naturlige fiender i økosystemet, har vi forsket på mulige tiltak for å gjøre dem til mindre effektive yngelpredatorer. For å redusere faren for at yngel skal havne i skvis mellom pelagiske predatorer som jager fra oversida og bunnlevende fra nedsida, har vi utviklet taresøyler som strekker seg fra bunnen og 15 meter opp i vannsøylen. Enhetene bryter ikke overflata og er derfor hverken visuelt skjemmende eller utsatt for bølgene rivekrefter i særlig grad. Settes de ut om høsten er de gjerne godt tilvokst neste vår. Utover ettersommeren og høsten ser vi at store mengder yngel fra torsk og seis slår seg ned i strukturene. Slike strukturer kan også benyttes til å etablere tareparker i områder som ikke har naturlige forutsetninger for tarevekst, for eksempel i områder med sandbunn. Selv om overfiske forårsaker kråkeboloppblomstring og tareskogskollaps, er det ikke nødvendigvis slik at det å slutte med fiske eller redusere fiskeriinsatsen får kråkebollene til å forsvinne igjen. Fordi tareskogen som forsvant kan være en viktig del av livssyklusen til disse kråkebollepredatorene. Det er et argument for aktive restaureringstiltak. Men det er viktig å tenke helhetlig. I Porsangefjorden arbeider Havforskningsinstituttet sammen med Porsanger kommune for å iverksette et gjennombyggingsprosjekt for fjordtorsk, som involverer en bruk av gytemære med innfang av torsk for å sikre økte eggmengder i forlatte gytefjorder, og to, etablering av kunstige tareparker for å øke overlevelsen hos yngel, og tre, etablering av områder beskyttet mot kommersielt fiske, slik at det kan bygges opp en naturlig bestand som inneholder flere store individer og mange flere flergangsytere enn i dag. Takk så mye, Hans Christian. Det var en veldig interessant presentasjon. Um, so moving on to think more about climate change. How can we restore blue forests in places where climate change is already causing their losses? Our next intervention is Melinda Coleman. She's the principal research scientist in the Department of Primary Industries in Australia. And she's going to talk about future-proofing blue forests. And I'm really eager to learn about more about what this means. So welcome to you, Melinda, and the floor is yours. Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me. My name is Mel Coleman and I'm from the Department of Primary Industries in Australia. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was future-proofing our, our kelp forests and how we can actually go about doing that. 
I'm sure you've heard all week um, about how amazingly beautiful and important our, our kelp forests are. They're extremely ecologically important and economically important. They provide food and shelter to a whole range of different critters. They underpin fisheries and they provide, you know, a whole raft of um, different ecosystem goods and services that we rely on as, as, as humans. Yet despite the importance of kelp forests, they are in decline and we've lost kelp forests from many parts of the world. And you can see here from this graphic that one of the major causes of decline are um, climate induced um, change, things like warming and marine heat waves. We can see from the sort of reds and sort of orange colours here that we've started to lose kelp forests from places like Western Australia, Japan, um, the US and even Norway. And what is becoming really clear is that climate change, climate change is starting to outpace the ability of kelp to adapt in many parts of their range. And the question is now, what can we actually do about this? So traditionally people have sought to recover and to revive areas. Um, that is to, I guess, reactively bring back what was lost. But I think it's pretty apparent now that um, this won't be effective in our future oceans and that we really need to start reinforcing and redefining kelp forests to proactively boost their resilience to, to future change, what we might call future proofing. And this is essentially where we anticipate what environmental conditions our future oceans will face and we take proactive um, actions now to prepare um, kelp forests um, for those future conditions. So one way that we could do this is to introduce what we might call climate resilient kelp individuals or genotypes into existing kelp forests to proactively boost their thermal resilience, um, thermal stress. And our work off Western Australia has already revealed where these individuals might occur. So firstly, we've shown using genomics that warm low latitude populations have been selected for thermal tolerance and could be good candidates. Even at our cooler mid-latitude sites, we know that there exist certain strong genotypes or a mix of individuals, including some that tend to perform a lot better than others under thermal stress. And again, we could target these in our, in our future proofing efforts. Um, thirdly, we've also shown that after extreme um, events, in this case after a marine heat wave, that there is uh, directional selection for thermal tolerance, which increases the frequency of heat adapted individuals in population. So we know now how to get our hands on these um, on these resilient individuals that we could add into population. So how do we get them into those populations? That's the, ne the next big step. So we could use uh, traditional techniques for restoring kelp forests. Um, that is harvesting adult plants and, and transplanting them into, into new and degraded areas. But I can tell you from experience that this is extremely labor intensive. It limits the number of donor plants that you can, that you can use and therefore the number of different genotypes you can add into populations. It can only be done on small scales. It costs a lot of money and it's just really, really hard work. Um, so a couple of years ago now, colleagues here in Norway developed what we call green gravel. And green gravel is a relatively simple technique. It's simply uh, rocks or gravel or small boulders that are seeded with kelp gametophytes. And they're then grown up in the lab and at, at uh, some point they're scattered over degraded reefs. And we've shown that this can work in trials now in Norway, but also in Australia. And more recently, colleagues have had success in Portugal. And I think what is really special about green gravel is that it's a new technique that is going to allow us to actually add these selected or these thermally tolerant genotypes or any other genotype for that matter um, to be rapidly reseeded into degraded reefs and at large scale. It's also extremely cost effective and it's easy and can often negate the need to actually use um, scuba divers. And green gravel has shown such promise. The projects utilising it are now going on all around the globe as part of our Green Gravel Action Group. And this is a group of, of researchers and restoration practitioners that are working on all sorts of different kelp species and habitats and restoring kelp forests using green gravel. And we come together in, in meetings and workshops to share our successes and also our failures and learn from each other and basically to take this promising restoration technique into the future. And what's going to be really exciting to explore are these future proofing strategies. So using green gravel to try to boost the resilience of, of kelp forests to future stress. Um, and essentially, I guess, ensure that um, kelp forests continue um, to thrive in our future oceans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. Um, what are the range of future proof restoration options to deal with climate driven changes? 
Yeah, look, um, there are a whole range of different sort of um, things that fall under this banner of future proofing. But um, I guess what they all have in common is that they're either, you know, management or conservation or, or restoration um, type strategies that um, instead of really reactively managing for things that have already happened or for today's conditions, they actually look ahead and try to anticipate what sort of environmental conditions our future oceans will, will be like um, and to try to anticipate that now. And so some of the things that, that people might have heard of are things like um, assisted adaptation where we could, um, for example, take more um, thermally sort of heat tolerant genotypes of, of kelp and introduce those into, into populations that we know are going to be thermally stressed going forward into the, into the future. There's things like um, genetic rescue, which is where we might um, add genetic diversity into populations that are genetically depauperate. Maybe they're really isolated or, or they've undergone some kind of decline. And one day we might even go as far as doing things like um, gene editing and synthetic biology, I guess, to, to design kelps to, to be resilient to any kind of stressor that, that we might want them to be resilient to. Um, but again, what's, what's really important at this present time is that all of these future proofing strategies um, have all of the little bits of science done and we start chipping away at that science so that um, when we do get to the point in, in the future that we want to implement these strategies, you know, we have all of that science to, to underpin them and, and to do them sensibly. And, um, you know, we also need to be having all these conversations with um, governments and regulators and policymakers, um, as well as coastal communities, so that we ensure that everyone's on board with these sort of techniques and that we're able to, um, you know, ensure the future of, of the kelp forest that, that we want and the services that we want them to, to provide for us. Thank you so much. Um, that's really, really interesting. And, and I, we're really lucky that we get to discuss this more during the panel later on. So thank you. Before we move to our next uh, uh, speaker, who is Jan Verbeck. He's a scientific forester in a company called Sea Forest. We're going to show a short TV cut, uh, a BBC cut from what he's actually uh, doing when it comes to uh, um, maintaining our blue front yards. Paul Bakken is the founder of Sea Forester and Seaweed Solutions, who farm seaweed for food, animal feed, fertilizer, and bioplastics. If you look at the total area available on this planet, down to 30 meters, that area equals 15 million square kilometers. Wow. It's about three times the size of Amazon, it's the size of America and Europe, a large area that is available where sun hits the bottom. It's like a huge solar panel that is very productive. What we're doing here is planting a forest in the sea. These stones have tiny patches of baby seaweed attached to them. And seaweed, just like crops on land, draws down carbon from the atmosphere in order to photosynthesize and grow. So seaweed forests have the potential to trap that carbon on the seabed. What really drives you to do this? Why is it so important? I think it's important because it can make such a huge impact. So you need to farm the ocean much more than it's been done before and also get the wild forests back on track. And by farming it, so you could not only reduce carbon, you could actually produce consumable goods from it. Yes, it can be used for humans as food, as cosmetics, as pharmaceuticals, many, many different applications, but also for animals as feed. And it can be used for plants as, uh, fertilizer. as fertilizer as well. So the world needs biomass. So we believe it's a very sustainable biomass with many, many application areas. So you're boosting biodiversity, you're reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, you're doing it at a place where no one's already living, you're not taking up any excess land. Most of your inputs are free, they're already there. And it's natural, it's a forest. Are we right here today on the Portuguese coast seeing a little bit of the future? I believe so strongly. And we're, uh, I'm now eager to, to uh, have Jan exploring how private sector can, can tr contribute into reforestation. Please, Dion, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Hello everyone and thank you for joining the talk. Today I will be uh, speaking about building the blue economy through seaforestation. Uh, my name is Jan Verbeek and I work for an environmental impact organization called Seaforester that is dedicated to restoring the forgotten forests in our oceans. So what is the problem today? Marine forests are disappearing at an alarming rate worldwide and unfortunately there is a real large disparity between our current efforts to restore and the scale of loss. Now if we look at the current loss of marine forests and the typical scale of restoration projects, which are very small, we would have needed roughly 300 million projects in 2021 alone just to keep pace with current declines. Now this of course is a very crude calculation, but it highlights this large disparity and the real need for effective upscaling strategies to match the scale of loss that we are experiencing today. The proposed solution to this issue is something we call the Blue Front Yard approach. So this approach looks at shallow coastal marine systems in a very holistic manner uh, and aims to restore healthy seaweed forests from degraded seascapes using multi-sectoral collaborations between local authorities, uh, science, industry and community groups uh, that implement scalable restoration solutions. One such solution is the Green Gravel method. A real key aspect of this approach is also to leverage uh, blue economy industries that together can propel a transition uh, in the scale of marine forest restoration and this is really needed today. Seaforest's business model is built to accommodate exactly this approach. So we bring together business, science and capital to provide the needed services to implement seaforestation projects in the Brewfront Yard of coastal communities. And these are some of the key blue economy industries that should be involved in seaforestation. So the restoration industry can really take a lead and coordinate and implement restoration activities and even provide financial support. The seaweed cultivation industry can significantly upscale our production capacity of something like green gravel by supplying commercial scale quantities of uh, seed stock to restoration practitioners. The fishing industry, and here we generally talk about local artisanal fishermen, they could also even be paid to uh, go out and deploy the seed material over degraded reefs. And with green gravel, the, the beauty is that it is very easy to deploy, so it can be done by anyone without any um, specialist knowledge. The marine tech industry, and in particular monitoring tech, will also become increasingly important when we are trying to assess restoration success over large spatial uh, areas because conventional approaches just uh, using scuba divers are just not uh, feasible both in terms of logistics and cost effectiveness. Now if we're looking to restore kelp forests from urchin barrens, which is still a huge problem especially in northern parts of Norway, uh, fi local fishermen could even go out and harvest sea urchin from these barrens and thereby support restoration initiatives. If an urchin ranching industry exists then the fishermen could even sell the urchins to those enterprises that can transform them into a high-value seafood product, which is urchin roe. Now, urchin roe is a marketable resource, meaning that marine forest restoration from urchin barrens actually comes with its market-based incentive. So, by leveraging these economies, seaforestation can really diversify the income stream of these businesses and build increased financial resilience through these novel supply chains. Further than that, developing further market-based incentives for marine forest restoration using, for example, carbon nutrient and biodiversity credits, uh, we can in the future also tap into further financial support and funding streams to really get uh, seaforestation implemented at scale. But marine forest restoration also comes with many environmental and economic benefits that will support blue economy growth. Seaweed forests provide many ecosystem services with great environmental value, for example, for tackling current climate and environmental challenges. Uh, but at the same time, these habitats also provide an immense economic value to a huge variety of industries. So for instance, the seaweed industry will benefit from enhanced uh, seaweed biomass that they can harvest for human consumption or other purposes. The fishing industry really benefit from enhanced fisheries resources because of these highly productive ecosystems and the marine tourism and recreation industry will benefit from the rehabilitation of these beautiful and biologically diverse habitats that recreational ocean users and tourists are looking for. So overall marine forest restoration is of immense value to society by supporting a healthy planet, providing food and creating jobs. 
Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And please get back to me with any comments or feedback that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jan. That was really interesting, and I think it uh, it touched well upon the the uh, discussions and deliberations we had yesterday about how to put value on blue forests. You really demonstrated how reforestation actually can can create jobs in many sectors. I wonder uh, you'll stay with us in the debate, but I wonder if. Um, could you uh, provide an example of how restoration that is led by local communities restoring their blue front yard? Yes, of course. Um, so an example of this would actually be the municipality of Cascais in Portugal, where we actually located with Sea Forester. Uh, with them, we have actually collaborated from, from the very start. And this collaboration has also really allowed us to have like an ideal environment to, to test this approach that we call the blue front yard approach. Uh, and also further develop the green gravel method that is our main tool for restoration. And uh, together with the municipality, we're actually um, assessing currently the potential for seaforestation in the Blue Front Yard and are already engaging with some relevant local stakeholders, for example, some uh, local fishermen, uh, the naval club, some dive centers. So to really start to leverage some existing infrastructure, but also then um, later on ensure some industry support because that's gonna be, as I explained in the presentation, be quite important when we try to progress to scale, which we are currently working towards in Cascais. So Cascais, we kind of envision them to, to function a bit like a showroom for our approach that then will help uh, to incentivize other municipalities here in Portugal, but also abroad uh, to, to adopt the approach to really get uh, the impact going here in Portugal and, and everywhere else. Thank you so much, uh, Jan. We're happy that you're with us in the panel discussion later on. We'll move on. Um, yesterday, we heard about how sea urchins had turned the poor Sangerfjord into almost a desert. Norway's northern kelp forests are degraded and overgraded. Our next speaker is Helena Mikkelsen. Uh, she's a postdoc at uh, NIVA, or the Norwegian Institute for Water Research. She'll inform us about ways to restore these barrens at scale. I'm told that she will talk to us about anything from sushi and voluntary divers' contribution to the restoration of kelp forests. Her presentation will be in Norwegian with uh, English uh, subtitles. So welcome, Helena. The floor is yours. Hi, my name is Helena Kling Mikkelsen. I work for NIVA. Och idag så ska jag fortälla lite grann om hur sushi och frivilliga tarevaktare kan bidra till restaurering av tarskogen. Längs kusten av Norge så har 50 miljoner ton tarskog blivit bitet bort av kråkeboller och kusten domineras nu av en kråkebollerörken. Forskare med NIVA, HI och andra institutioner har jobbat aktivt med flera olika metoder längs med kusten för att restaurera tarskogen. Och det har blivit gjort genom transplantering av planter, det har blivit hamring och det har kalkat kråkeboller. Och alla resultaten är pekar i riktning av att tarn är i stånd att komma tillbaka till sig själv när kråkebollen försvinner. Men det som är viktigt för långvarig växt av tare i sådana områden är att kråkebollen hålls nere över längre tid. De här tidigare fältförsöken har visat att det att fjärna kråkebollen från ett litet område är enkelt. Men att det att oskalera och vedlikehålla restaurerad tareskog är både krävande och kostbart. Så för att oskalering ska vara möjlig är det viktigt att man involverar beslutningstagare, kommuner, industri, forskningsinstitutioner och allmänheten. Och också brukar flera olika metoder. Det pågår nu flera projekt som ser på möjligheten för att oskalera fjärning av kråkeboller för att skapa ett gott fiskeri. Och ett av de här projekten med multidisciplinära partner för Tsunomics, Niva, Aquaplan Niva, Nofima och fiskare från Noreng önskar att etablera blågröna aktiviteter med mål om att få ta i skogen tillbaka. Genom finansiering från anonyma filantroper i Asia så är mål att kunna demonstrera att uppskalering av sådana aktiviteter faktiskt är möjlig. Och tanken är att om man kan utnyttja kråkebollen som en ekonomisk resurs vid kråkebollehöstare kunde hålla kråkebollepopulationen nede över längre tid. Ökonomics, som är en av våra samarbetspartnere, har startat och etablerat en kråkebollindustri med rognäsbart till sushi både i Europa och i Asien. Och projektet jobbar med att förbättra och testa ut olika teknologi som är egna för hösting, 
lagring och försändelse av klockboller. Och vi brukar då olika typer klockbollteiner och undervattensugare. Och de här teknikerna är er i färd med att uppskaleras. I tillägg till att man brukar teiner och annan teknologi för att samla klockboller, så är er det viktigt att reserveringsområdena blir övervakade och rydda för nya klockboller. Och för att hjälpa med detta så har tarevaktarna blivit etablerat i Tromsø. Det är er en grupp med frivilliga dykare från studenternas undervattensklubb i Tromsø. Och de jobbar aktivt med att fjärna och övervaka krokebollarna runt omkring i Tromsø området med mål om att bistå i tarereserveringen. För de här dykarna och för brukare av kysten generellt så är er det svårt givna att tarreskogen och dess biomangfald kommer tillbaka. Och det är er med på att skapa ett väldigt stort engagemang bland de här frivilliga. Och att det vart så uppskrivningar sker långt med kysten så kan flera och flera dykare och brukare av kysten vara med i det här frivilliga arbetet. Och måten man kan uppskalera tarreserveringar kan ske genom en stegvis process med att kombinera flera olika metoder. Och det kan man göra via att man intensivt höster kråkebollen i de här kråkebollarörknarna så att tare kan rekondensera. Det kan avbrukas tegner, det kan brukas droner, undervattensugare och dykare. Man kan också bruka andra restaureringsmetoder som kalking och kråkeboller. Och genom vidare övervakning och fjärning av kråkeboller undgår vi att en ny kråkebollarörken kommer tillbaka igen. Och här är tare och andra frivilliga viktiga att vara med. För de kan lätt få öje på ändringar i systemet och de kan plocka de kråkebollarna som undgår höstning. Och att det vart som naturliga predatorer kommer tillbaka in i systemet så sitter vi igen med starkt tare skogsekosystem. Så vi har skapat ett gott market med lokala fiskare som levererar kråkebollar för uppföring och som också involverar engagerade frivilliga och andra restaureringsmetoder så kan man både skapa en ny och viktig intäktskilde längs med kusten av Norge som tidig som vi restaurerar Tareskogen. Tusen tack för mig. Thank you Helena, that was so interesting. So I guess uh, eating sea urchins is good for blue forest. I wonder could you uh, uh, tell me a bit um, um, you know about the scales here? Can can fishing urchins um, um, well let me rephrase if we wanted to restore like uh, a thousand square kilometers of barrens in Norway would the, would the markets the urchin markets be enough to to support that uh, hi thank you well the exact demand and supply of sea urchins is really dynamic but it's estimated that about uh, that there's a need for about between 35,000 to 630,000 tons of big sea urchins on the market every year. But in addition, when the urchins are harvested, uh, about half of them are too small for the market. So when these ones are crushed or they can be used for other uh, uses such as pharmaceuticals or for, uh, yeah, for other uses. And because of this, the Norwegian fishermen could potentially remove up to 2 million tons of sea urchins per year in total. And because of the value and the global demand of sea urchins is high, the establishing a fishery could be an additional driving force for removing urchins in combination with the other restoration methods that's been discussed earlier in this session. Thank you so much, uh, Helena. So today we've talked a lot about kelp forests so far, but as we know, there are a lot of other different kinds of blue forests. And our final speaker before the panel today is Jane Glavin, and she's the co-owner of the company Distant Partner. And Jane's going to talk to us about mangrove restoration and exciting new technological advances. So, Jane? Hi, my name's Jane Glavin, and I'm a co-owner of Distant Imagery and I'll be chatting to you about drone utilization towards habitat restoration and specifically mangroves today. Drone habitat restoration, uh, specifically for mangroves, really does address multiple SDG goals from 
uh, goal nine from innovation and supporting uh, cities um, and livable space towards uh, climate change adaptation um, and really around habitat restoration, all the benefits that provides, but also towards the partnerships for the goals. Uh, for instance, a large scale restoration that we had just completed um, and a test pilot phase we just completed before previously, they were in partnership with a local government agency called uh, Environment Agency Abu Dhabi and NG, which is a French um, energy company, and, and ourselves. And this kind of partnership really was a prime example about how governments and private sector can work together uh, to help address you know, uh, sustainable development and the goals themselves. So for instance, um, Environment Agency provided the land, they provided their uh, ecologists and their expertise, the vast experience they brought to the table. Anji uh, paid, uh, they provided the finances for, for the projects, but not only that, they actually really participated actively. They brought uh, tons of volunteers and actually, you know, they were rolling seed balls, they were collecting seeds, and so they were actively engaged and we brought in the drone and, and the action behind it as well. So uh, really, it's uh, these partnerships are really essential towards achieving goals and working together. An important element for us is that it's not removing communities from mangrove planting, it's adding value to them and having them as part of the process itself through all the phases of the planting uh, and active engagement throughout, but also having communities be able, we're training, we're, we're working towards training uh, communities to have to build their own drones out of locally sourced materials such as plywood. And if they build them and we provide the rigging and we help them build the rigging, the planting rigging themselves, uh, they can maintain it and they can use it for other environmental analysis. So really it's a critical component that it truly is not removing communities. From the equation but it's adding value and having them as part of the process so yes our drones can plant about 2,000 seeds in about 10 minutes uh, germinated seeds and about 500 uh, seed balls in about 10 minutes as well um, but really what's important is, is that it's an ecosystem approach that we're really following uh, and that's vital to the discussion is that uh, yes, drones can help support and they uh, enable large amounts of planting in, one, in very quick time. But really all we're doing is that we're dropping the seeds and the seed balls in the right location at the right time, at the right tide level. We're making sure they're embedded, we're making sure they're in the sea and shade, we're making sure that the, the way the seeds are collected, uh, when they're collected, all these factors are really essential towards the success of the project. So really, yes, drones enable and support um, and, and, and be able to uh, fly large drone, drone swarms so you can get thousands at a time. But really, what's important is the ecosystem itself. So we learned a lot through the build-up to, to us flying and planting. Uh, in the planting phases themselves as well. Uh, we were initially around 25% uh, with the test pilots and success rate, and now we're about 35 to 37% um, this year for this, uh, for this current planting. Um, but it's very important to us that we, have, uh, we approach it with a data-driven approach uh, so that we can understand. So um, not only how we can improve how we're doing the planting and our methodologies, um, but also just understanding the environment itself. It's very, it's a very dynamic environment. Uh, so um, those two put together uh, is really integral to learning and trying to figure out how to get the, the best success rate possible. So always, we're always modifying as we learn um, and to our systems and to our drone planting, but also from the environmental aspect as well, understanding the, the ecology of uh, different sites uh, and learning how to best plant in them, uh, learning how to, and everything's 3D printed, so being able to, to uh, 
uh, really alter on the fly has been really uh, impactful for us that we were able to quickly modify as we're learning and just continuing and the growing. It is a, an exciting process and we hope uh, that others will be engaged at further as well and that we do get to work with some of the communities that we're talking to today. Thank you. Interesting to see technology being used in this way really to support conservation. So thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering if you can tell us about the benefits for countries like Norway um, to fund international efforts to restore and monitor mangroves. Hi. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. There's a uh, there's such um, there is so much benefit not only to climate change mitigation, um, also addressing multiple blue economy and SDG goals, um, but really funding those projects. And I know I said in the presentation, but it really is that funding those kinds of projects that really develop uh, the communities in developing countries so that they are building the drones, but also kites and balloons and the rigging themselves, having them actually build out of sustainable sources around them, such as pilot, et cetera, that allows them to actually modify it, allows them to uh, maintain it. And that gives the longevity of projects for development projects that most countries are looking for. They're looking for long-term solutions and having communities be able to do it themselves in a true way where it's out of sourced materials that they can readily access and fly themselves and use free software, et cetera, that gives that ownership and that gives that legacy to the project. And then from that, it becomes replicable and they start training others as well and start developing outwards. And so that is the true change is that really the community start doing it themselves. And then they start restoring mangroves in, uh, in the scale that makes sense to their sites, et cetera. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, you'll be with us on the panel a little bit later, so maybe we'll hear about it a bit more. So, But before we move to the panel discussion, we wanted to show you a live demonstration of how Blue Forest can help reduce storm damage by lowering the height of waves. And so to do that, I'll move to Stephen over at Great Arundel. So Stephen, are you ready? Are you with us? Welcome to Great Arundel and our Wave Tank Blue Forest demonstration, okay? My name is Stephen Lutz and I'm the Blue Carbon Lead at Grid Arundel. And here are some of my colleagues from Grid Arundel. Say hi. Hi. Hello. And today what we're going to be doing is demonstrating how healthy blue forest ecosystems help buffer and protect coastal communities in, around the world from the impacts of um, storms and wave energy. Okay? So here's our wave tank. Okay? And think of this as the ocean and this as the shoreline. And we have a reservoir here to see um, the level of water from, uh, the, 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 this represents the flooding of a coastal community, okay? Let's put a little bit of water back in, not too much. And we'll start a wave, okay? So think about a tropical storm bearing down on a tropical island, okay? So one, two, three, four, and you can see now our coastal community is completely flooded okay so now there's water everywhere can does anybody have any idea of the impacts of that coastal flooding and that coastal intrusion flooding houses yeah mm -hmm. flooding infrastructure so i'm thinking of the roads bridges, yes and that sort of stuff i can't go to the beach yeah so you can't go to the beach and neither can the tourists so there's less money um for the coastal for the coastal economy, which is bad and we don't want that, okay? So now you can see I've drained all the water out. We'll put it back in in a sec, okay? And now let's see the simulation with our healthy blue forest ecosystems. First, we have our mangrove forests. We're gonna put those in and think about happy birds living in the branches and fish and juvenile fish living in the uh, roots of the mangroves because Healthy blue forest ecosystems are not important just for um, buffering shorelines, but they also help support local biodiversity, okay? Here we have some seagrass beds. Let's put that in there too. 
and think about happy um, uh, stingrays and crabs living in those seagrass beds, um, and happy people eating those yummy crabs from the sea, from the seagrass beds. Let's put the water back in. No cheating. All right, not too much to the correct level. All right, and now we're going to do the simulation one more time, but this is with our protectant from our from our natural nature based or nature positive solutions to climate change adaptation. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. And you can see now the dramatic effect. There's a lot less water in our coastal communities because we've had our healthy blue forest ecosystems to protect them. So the idea being here is that if we can help conserve and restore our blue forests, they will help us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for that really informative and great hands-on um, example of how blue forest ecosystems can support coastal communities. So thank you again. We'll now move on to uh, the final part of this uh, session, the, uh, the panel debate or discussion, I should say. Um, I guess we've heard now a lot of different angles um, to take in for the participants. We'll try and wrap this up and, uh, and discuss uh, how all these attempts and all their variety can be scaled up, whether there is a need to do so, what the aim should be and so forth. So let me first check if you're all with us. Uh, Hans Christian Strand, are you, are you there? <coughs> I'm here. Yeah, thank you. And Peter? I'm here. What about Melinda? Yep, I'm here. Perfect. And uh, Jan, Jan, are you there? Yes, also here. Helena? Yep, I'm here. And Glenn. That is perfect. So we have all the participants here. I also have a few questions uh, on the screen from the audience. So let me start with a question to you, Hans. Uh, you've been involved in kelp restorations for over a decade. Is there enough support nationally for kelp restoration in Norway? Uh, it depends <coughs> on what you mean about support. We have, uh, we have got we have uh, got the necessary licenses to carry out both small and large scale uh, experiments and we have also um, uh, received funding from the research council so we have uh, been able to do uh, quite a lot of work uh, even though some are uh, quite skeptical naturally to this approach and um, but i think um, for the next tape for the next level we need to uh, probably work, since it's not working all the time, we need to, to work more on the nuts and bolts of the method itself. Uh, and also, if we can make this work um, as a management tool, it will be up to the politicians to uh, decide whether we should apply this method on, uh, on balance or whether other, uh, other methods should be used. But, but I think first we need to do, to do some more work with the uh, method itself so that we can say with some confidence that uh, if you do this and all that then you will recover the area uh, recover the kelp forest no matter what the, the habitat looks like thank you so much um, moving on to a question for Helena um, so the quicklime restoration of the Porzanger fjord is the largest successful restoration of urchin barrens in the world and the third third largest kelp forest restoration project ever. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about quick liming, maybe something around what are the impacts on the other species, um, and and should we be rolling out this technique kind of on a massive area in northern Norway? Uh, yes, the restoration of Porsanger Fjord has been really effective, and the results are really promising. But the Norwegian government are a little bit hesitant to upscale such efforts at the moment because the technique could, as you say, harm other organisms other than the sea urchins. So at the moment, you need to have a permit or approval and a permit before you can quick climb an area. And as Hans Christian mentioned in his presentation, although the quick climb is reactive during a really short period of time, recent laboratory studies at NEVA 
has uh, shown that depending on the particle size and the concentration of the quicklime, it could have negative effects on other organisms, especially other echinoderms like uh, starfish, but also some worms and snails. And currently some of the field experiments using the quicklime in Northern Norway has been done in urchin barrens where there's not that much other fauna present. So we don't know what effects it could have on different areas with different types of uh, wildlife. And we also seen in other ex field experiments using the exact same methods with quick climbing as in Pachanga Fjord, that it didn't reduce the urchins enough to restore the kelp. And it seems that the method is less effective in areas where it's rocky, where the urchins can hide in between rocks or in crevices. So there is still a need to understand what effects the quick lime can have on other organisms and to find the correct methods that is effective to, re to uh, remove the urchins. So what particle size, concentration, and what kind of areas are good for using it. So that's what's needed before upscaling. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So let's move then to Peter. Uh, I mean, we've clearly seen kelp comes back when you restore boulder reefs. Could we imagine that other hard substrates, such as infrastructure like wind farms, jetties and seawalls, or artificial reefs of any kind could be used to increase seaweed, seaweed habitats? Absolutely, and this is something that is being discussed currently. I think we have to really distinguish here between restoration and creating new habitats. Um, because you might infer that uh, you can have a win-win situation by installing offshore wind farms or other hard structures that you will also benefit biodiversity, but it will also be at some cost for the existing nature, soft bottom communities, etc. So it, you really have to balance out the cost there and the benefits and also some of these hard structures could potentially become stepping stones for species being introduced into an area that we would not want to. So this is where we have to be a little bit careful about how we use restoration in terms of habitats and uh, biodiversity. Thank you. Um, so the next question will be for Melinda. Um, we just heard about this really exciting green gravel technique, which was developed in Norway and is now being used around the world. Um, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the ongoing projects that you have and, and why this tool has such a potential for restoring at large scales. Yeah, look, green gravel has really taken off all around the world. I think um, as part of the Green Gravel Action Group, there are something like 14 different projects, probably more than that now, um, across four different continents. So people have just been really enthusiastic in, in taking that up and trying it all over the world for all these different species and under all sorts of situations. And, and most of those restoration um, projects are in their very early stages and, and we're still getting the results in. But, you know, one of the reasons that it has been so successful is that, um, I mean, underwater restoration is just inherently extremely difficult. <laughs> if anyone's tried it, they, they definitely know that. And so green gravel can overcome some of those issues, things like, um, you know, it avoids the need to use engineered structures underwater, you know, underwater drilling and attaching um, adult donor plants to restore areas. Um, it also can, um, in most instances, actually um, avoid the need to use divers and therefore, you know, it becomes really accessible to, to community groups and sort of untrained um, people. Um, and it can also be applied over really, really large scales, which again is a huge improvement over some of these traditional restoration techniques. But I mean, from my perspective as well, one of the other um, real benefits going forward into the future is that it can be used to future-proof these kelp forests. Um, and it's the perfect way that we might be able to seed these, these gravel with some of these um, resilient genotypes, whether that be thermally tolerant or genotypes that are resilient to other stresses and very quickly and at large scales, get them into our kelp forest to, to try to boost their, their resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Let's move on to, to Jane. I also have some uh, questions from the audience. We're running a bit late, but I think uh, uh, this is so interesting. So we'll just try and uh, go through. So Jane, uh, what do you see as the, the key technological innovations that can help restoration of mangroves and uh, maybe other, also other types of, uh, of blue forest? Absolutely. From, uh, there are some advancements such as in 3D printing that really will change how 
uh, nimble and uh, different, be able to use 3D printing in different ways, such as reef domes, etc. cetera, um, smaller battery sizes and they, those being more powerful so you can carry the drones for much longer distances integrating uh, artificial intel intelligence with LiDAR. So eventually, five, 10 years from now, drones will be able to fly. And on the fly, as they're flying, they'll be able to change. Uh, they'll be able to sense the soil types, elevation, and be able to uh, change where they're planting and how the depth of the seed balls, how they enter the soil. So it's quite exciting out there and possibilities but I'd like to bring it back also that it's still an ecological process. Um, so the really, as uh, my Australian colleague had mentioned, it's really understanding also uh, the future of what the coastline will look like under climate change and making it um, future proof for that as well. It's understanding how the coastline is changing. Um, that kind of information and, and science uh, learning those aspects are equally as important. Understanding germination and how uh, to best um, support the environment in doing so, uh, where to plant, all these kind of um, information is needed. Uh, there might, there is questions around large scale. Uh, it doesn't make sometimes sense for large scale restoration. So new technologies can help support that. But at the other end, we also have to balance the question of, where it makes sense to do large scale restoration, are we replacing other habitats by doing so? Where is the best place to do that? So it's a combination of this excitement of new technologies that are taking place and can really help support the environment. But again, the environment is, it needs to take the lead on, on how we do that. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, the final question from us before we move to questions from the audience is, is for Jan. So the challenge of the UN decade of restoration really can only be met if everybody, local governments, private sector, academia, civil society, come together to find viable, long-lasting solutions. What common ground do you see for people working together to restore blue forest ecosystems? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think, as, as we're all aware now, uh, many of our economies, livelihoods, and human well-being really depend on a healthy ocean. So I think, first and foremost, there needs to be kind of a common understanding that not protecting or restoring these blue forest habitats will kind of have dire consequences for, for us, like our economies, human well-being in the kind of near future. And that's, that will be felt by all of us, and it doesn't matter what part of society or sector uh, you belong to. So restoring blue forests and also thereby enhancing ecosystem services, like we've heard in a lot of the talks uh, that we had so far, and also the natural capital, uh, will benefit everyone from a state government that uh, might use that to help contribute to meeting um, their nationally determined uh, contributions to reducing greenhouse gas emissions of uh, various industries that either have like a direct or even indirect uh, benefit from the goods and services that, the, that these ecosystems provide. Um, but all the way also to academia and civil society. So I think really the common ground is that um, for these people to come together is the knowledge that by taking action now, they will be able to contribute to a more sustainable future for themselves as well as everyone else. Uh, and I think that should really be enough incentive for, for all of us to come and work together to really tackle this issue of our disappearing forest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have to prioritize really hard here uh, when it comes to questions from the audience. I've picked one from uh, uh, Gunnar Sander, who was with us in the, in the previous session. Uh, and uh, it's an open question to the whole panel. Can the panelists reflect on when restoration is not recommendable or what other large scale problems that could be tackled before restoration can take place? Anybody wants to take the challenge? 
I can start. I mean, I think one of the first things before embarking on any restoration project is to ensure that the stressor that caused the loss of, of the kelp forest or whatever habitat it might be is, is gone. And, you know, um, some of the restoration projects that I've been involved in, that, that is one of the first things that we did, particularly where it's something like poor, poor water quality that's involved and, you know, the, the seaweed or the kelp forest needs, needs help coming back. I mean, obviously with um, climate stresses, that's a little bit more difficult. And I think that that's where we need to be looking at some of these um, alternate things like, like future proofing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, unfortunately, we need to move on. The uh, Blue Forest Week is coming to, uh, to an end. Uh, however, don't forget the, the, that there are still blue discussions going on today. But this, ses this uh, last session of the, the conference uh, uh, is coming to an end. So um, um, I think before that we'll have just, a, uh, I'm going to wrap up the, the, the conference with, uh, with a couple of the protagonists behind it in a minute, but I think we'll have a short break before uh, I do that. Uh, so see you in a couple of minutes. So we're back finally. I really wanted to uh, take in one of the two protagonists uh, and the main organizers behind the Blue Forest Week 2021. That is uh, Cecilia Vatne. She's the uh, Norwegian Blue Forest Network uh, uh, project leader. And Kaja Astal, who's expert on coastal ecosystems at uh, Grid Arndal. Uh, there are many more, but these two will have to uh, kind of uh, uh, speak for, for everyone who have been working really hard to, to realize this uh, conference. So Cecilia, first, can you just explain to me what is the Blue Network for, uh, for kelp, Blue Forest Network? Yeah, so the Norwegian Blue Forest Network is a network that now consists of Grid Arendal, NIBA and the Institute for Marine Research. And we have been working together for the last seven years to really try to lift up both in Norway and globally the focus on blue forests. Um, and working also to try to get more and more people excited and involved on this important topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And wha what do you think, in your view, uh, what is the, the, the main takeaways from this conference? Uh, what are you most happy with? Yeah, I think it's been a really great week. We've had amazing speakers, a really active audience. And for me, it's just been that we've, we've managed to pull together some really interesting points and questions to keep discussing. And especially today with this focusing on, yes, blue forests are important. People are realizing this now. 
Now there's a lot of different ways we can go about addressing this. So getting that and moving forward with that and getting us excited to do even more. Super. Uh, what about you, Kaya? Are you happy? Yes, I am very happy. I'm, I agree with Cecilia. Uh, and I'm also especially happy about the number of politicians that we've had. Mm -hmm. uh, and I very much look forward to seeing how they're going to integrate the good advice that they're receiving from the researchers and work with managers to make real things happen for Blue Forest, both in Norway and internationally. Awesome. What about uh, the viewers, the participants at the conference? Will they be able to, to uh, uh, give their opinion on the conference? Yes, they will. Uh, we're going to have an evaluation form. It's basically ready to be sent out, so that will be sent out within the next few days. So we hope that as many as possible of our participants will uh, answer that form so that we can improve and know what to do better next time. Well, that's fantastic. And also, um, I think um, you've told me that the conference uh, will be soon available on the internet for everybody to, to watch and pick up on, uh, on things. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much. It's been a pleasure to work with you these days and I've definitely learned uh, a lot from, from doing this. Yeah. And, uh, and thank you. And bef uh, you have done a great <laughs> job <laughs> <laughs> leading us through a few couple of hectic wow, days. Wow, Cecilia, really thank you. I really appreciate that, Annalena. <laughs> that is <And> so pretty. <laughs> what a and, surprise. Uh, and thank you also to the, for everyone who came and tuned in these last few days. And we, like the other days, we will have blue discussions that take place from now until the next 40 minutes. We're going to have two rooms this time. You go into the same room and you'll get a choice. You can either discuss how do we protect our blue forests, which will be a conversation kelp led... Restoration. Yeah, kelp restoration. Led by Gunnar Sander from Niva. Uh, and that will be in Norwegian. And there will also be a discussion on how do we restore our blue forests with a discussion led by Karen Philby dexter from the Institute of Marine Research in English. Okay, thank you very much. So keep on, uh, uh, everybody, uh, log off this session and uh, log on to the next, the blue discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you.